The documentary is extremely heavy and in a sense that it's so deeply personal on so many levels from my emancipation to the moment of finding my sister and to the story unfolding of abuse and coming out of the sport and testifying in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee and making a change for you know future. It's just, it's been a colorful life <laughs> to say the least. Welcome to Bitch Talk. I'm your host, Aaron, here with my co-host, Ange, aka Captain Party. And over the last 10 years, we've been elevating marginalized voices through interviews and events. Sometimes over a glass of whiskey. If you're thirsty for more bitches, head over to bitchtalkpodcast.com and follow us on Instagram. A big thank you to 48 Hills and our listeners for voting us Best of the Bay Best Podcast in 2022 and 2023. And now, on with the show. Welcome to our South by Southwest 2024 film festival coverage. Today we're bringing to you two films, one as a doc and one as a narrative, about the search for family. First we'll have She Looks Like Me. Second we'll bring you Bob Trevino Likes It, which won the South by Southwest Narrative Feature Grand Jury Award, as well as the South by Southwest Narrative Feature Audience Award. Enjoy! All right, welcome back to Bitch Talk at South by Southwest 2024. We're super excited about this interview for the documentary She Looks Like Me. We are sitting next to Dominique Mochiano, who is subject of the film, uh, Olympic gold medalist in gymnastics, if you've been hiding in a cave uh, 30 30 years ago or whenever that was. (laughs) But uh, welcome to the show, Dominique. Thank you. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, can you introduce everybody to this documentary? They haven't seen it yet. Yes, well, this is uh, very closely, you know, tied to my heart because of my memoir, Off Balance. Um, Our director, Torque, did a tremendous job really highlighting so much of the memoir coming to life on screen and being so sensitive to such intimate details of my life. I've never been so vulnerable in interviews, and I think people are going to see a different side of me. Um, And I think the relationship with my sister, Jen, that has developed and evolved over the years is something um, really exciting for both of us. We're both mothers now. And I think the just the story of hardship, reunion, um, going through so much in life, but coming out on the other side and making the best of it and hopefully inspiring others that no matter what life throws your way, you can overcome it and you can make something positive and turn something that could have been extremely negative into a positive. And there were so many hardships along the way. But I really feel that through our story and sharing it with others, they can hopefully be inspired that, you know, you too can come out of something that maybe you would have never imagined could happen in your life. And you can turn it around and and make it something that could be a really good inspirational story for not only yourself, but for others as well. So you wrote the memoir, you were in charge of of that. You can you can control that story. Mm-hmm. But when you're doing a documentary and it's it's real life now and you're on film, everyone's on film that chooses to be, um, how did you build trust with your director and with your family? Well, this was a long time in the making. There were many people who wanted to write the story of our lives on screen, and I turned away a lot of people over the years. But something really felt right with Torque as the director. There was an honesty and integrity of being very close to the book and being extremely sensitive to the needs that my sister and I really held close to our heart. We didn't want any exploitation of our families, and we wanted to make sure that um, someone really got it, right? So somebody has to get your story in order to have it come to life on screen. If they don't get it and there's not a connection, there's not an energy between you two, it's never going to come to life. There's got to be that vibrancy, you know, that that frequency of vibration that you know in your heart that this is the right person. And as soon as Torque and I had developed that relationship with my crew and my people as well, and Jen felt comfortable, 
we knew that Torque would be the right person because he just loved the book so much. And he dove into things when we would have conversations that other people didn't pick up on. And I knew that he really read it. Some people came and wanted to say, oh, I want to do a movie of your life and were really interested. But when you'd have conversations, they were surface conversations. There, were, there was no depth to, did you really read the book? Because I really... I can tell, <laughs> you know, you can tell when it's your life. And there are intimate details that, you know, Torque was able to pick up on that other people didn't. And I thought, okay, you really get it. You, you understand where this is going. And it took many years to get to this place, but I did not want to go with someone that did not have that wavelength, was not on the same wavelength of understanding our story to do it justice. And it is so closely depicted to the book that it's it's amazing how Torque was able to use his creativity and share the screen time between my sister and me to be able to share the parallel lives and also intertwine the creativity and tell the story in the manner in which he did. It's really fascinating that he was able to do it such justice. And I'm, I'm really proud of not only him, but all of the participants who contributed to making this story come to life and giving their expertise. And everybody's put so much labor of love into it. And I'm, I'm really filled with gratitude because this is really hard for me in some sense. I mean, I probably cried so many times watching the edits and originally just because it hits so deeply and you relive those moments when you're sharing the stories and they don't go away just easily. And so that's why with something so intimate and deep and personal in your life, there has to be somebody who can carry that material so sensitively to the screen and do it justice. And I feel that Torque did that, and I hope the audiences can see that. Yes, one, one million percent. It is such a heartfelt film. And watching you and your long-lost sister's childhood side by side, just the real stark difference between the two is really powerful, you know, the whole nature versus nurture thing. And um, I'm, I'm wondering when you first met her and started getting to know her, were you surprised at how similar you both were because of the fact that you grew up in such different environments, you still had a lot of common threads? Absolutely. The the irony of the whole thing with the nature versus nurture, we would bring that up constantly. The messages that Christina, my youngest and our youngest sister, and Jen, our middle sister, had on their voice messages when we met were almost verbatim at the time. And so we were just like, what? This is every time we would be having conversations, everything was turned to what? Oh my gosh, what? No, no way. And it just was like a constant conversation of, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. And then our mannerisms. If you see on screen, we, we have the same way we pull our hair. And, <laughs> and it's just like my sister Jen looks the most like my father. So when I would talk to her, her skin, her texture, she's the most. And she's like, really? She's like, is that a bad thing? I was like, no, no. I mean, he was handsome. And yes, he had his challenges and grew up in the way that he did, but I forgave him. You know, you have to move on with your life. And I forgave him and he wanted to meet you before he died. And he's deceased now. You know, there's, he can't say, he doesn't get to have a word in any of this. And that's okay. And I wanted to do it justice too, because deep down, He's a product of his communist upbringing. He's a, you know, I understood that years later. Yes, we, we butt heads and yes, I had a very strong will and I believed that, you know, a woman in the household doesn't need to just be a servant. And I know that that was just old times that was part of his culture. He didn't grow out of that. And I forgave him before he died, you know, and he for he felt like he was a bad father at times and I can't I'll never forget my 21st birthday when he told me that he loved me and I was in tears this is the first time I heard the words and I was like you know maybe he didn't get that from his father so there's a lot of history and trauma that you start to uncover and unfold the older you get and you start to see it from a different vantage point it doesn't mean that those times didn't hurt just as much and uh, I'm not justifying or excusing that behavior but I understand I think I'm a little more understanding than when you're a teenager you're, you're a little bit different right so you're self-centered then and everything's about you and your hormones and everything but 
you know, as you start to have distance, you have perspective. And this is why I wanted to do this document at a time in my life where I had enough perspective that there was a maturity with the film. There was a, you know, evolution of the story and the life and all of us. And so when you look at Jen and Christina and me, our mannerisms when we're together and the nature versus nurture story, it's so powerful that you could have two young individuals grow up in completely separate environments yet gravitate towards the same sport towards the <laughs> same likings of food towards the same body language and it's just fascinating just on that kind of a level even in our own lives with each other but then me being the oldest I always feel like I have to explain everything to everyone and make everybody like included and um but so that took a toll on me that responsibility you know but but I think I stepped up to the plate <laughs> Of course, yes, clearly you did. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up that you both took up the same sport because a, a lot of her taking up that sport was because she watched you and was inspired by you, which many of us did, including us, uh, the two of us here. Just, I just, uh, if I could go back to 1996 Olympics, watching you and just being in awe and the Magnificent Seven and you did it. And f as the viewer, you saw how that inspired everyone that was watching, but coming to find out what you were going through in that moment and how it was just so different from all the people that you were inspiring, including your long lost sister. Does that change the experience for you? Does it make it a little easier to, to look back on? Well, distance and maturity and growth has allowed me to look back on that time very differently. I will always be grateful to be a part of the first U.S. women's gymnastics team. I mean, we set the stage and we were, you know, pioneers in our sport. And we were the first women to stand on that podium next to Russia and Romania. And it had never been done. So I will always be um, a part of that special story where we changed the landscape of gymnastics forever and we inspired so many. So for that, I'm, I'm filled with gratitude now. At the time, yes, I had so many mixed emotions, um, disappointment of my coaches, um, disappointment in my father's reaction. And of course you wish that things were different at that time and they weren't and I can't change that. All I can change is how I choose to view it now and to be grateful and not live in that, you know, in that sad space. And yes, it happened, so I have to acknowledge it. And I was so torn at the time that it was so hard to understand what my emotions were because I was going through so many and just felt like heartbroken and abandoned by people that were supposed to be there for me, you know, in my sport, encouraging me, uplifting me. And um, any time that there was an error, it was, no, you're fat, no, you're this, so you're a disappointment. And it was like, that's not, that's not the way that young adolescents need to, to be treated in such a highly competitive sport. Um, and so I have a lot more distance. Uh, it's just unfortunate that that moment in your life can never be changed. Like you can't have that pure mm -hmm. elation where you dream of it and you see so many athletes have that pure joy. So I feel like that was robbed from me a little bit. It was stolen that moment, but I tried to do my best to, to be stoic in the moment. And now I, I certainly view that medal, um, so differently. And in retrospect, I'm, I'm grateful because no one can ever take that away. And I did it despite everything that was going on in my life. So I have to give myself some credit, even if people didn't at the time or coaches didn't, or I didn't feel validated for some reason and um, because you, you wait for that praise, you know, when you're young, you wait for that somebody to say, good job, you know? And also at the age of 14, sorry. Like, right. We, yeah. just, also, you were 14. I don't want right. to talk about what I was doing when I was 14. <laughs> right. It's, it's just, yeah, it's a lot to put it's on lot. your young shoulders. Yeah. It's a lot. It's emotional. It's a lot. It's heavy. You know, the documentary is extremely heavy and in a sense that it's so deeply personal on so many levels from my emancipation to the moment of finding my sister and to the story unfolding of abuse and coming out of the sport and testifying in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee and, in, um, committee and making a change for, you know, future. It's just, it's been a colorful life, <laughs> to say the least. And you're still young. 
I'm still, I'm still, <laughs> still young. Life to I'm live. still young. Yes, <laughs> but yes. Did, chapter two. I, I did want to touch um, on something, and I didn't read the memoir. So if mm-hmm. it was in there, please explain more about sure. what I'm going to ask. But mm-hmm. um, I just wanted to know at what point did you agree to talk about the abuse on camera um, that you suffered by your father and the Crowleys? And um, it's, it's so much to do in front of a camera versus just writing it down and you're not in an audience sitting with people and then having to field questions right after. So can you talk about that choice? Yes, I remember it very distinctly. It was 2008, Brian Gumbel's Real Sports. Um, John Frankel, I believe, was interviewing me and it was one of those moments where I knew I was going to be asked this question before I got onto the hot seat and I remember going to the bathroom and I'm like, okay, am I going to do this? this? This is now or never, but I know what the backlash is going to be. I'm going to be called all sorts of names. I'm going to be blacklisted. I'm going to be this. It's going to be severe. Um, but it was a time of truth. Like I needed to say it. It was just in here in my heart and on my mind. And I just could not continue with people just skirting around the truth and just being dishonest and, I really felt like it was an important and critical time to speak up. And if no one else was going to say anything, okay, I'm going to, because at that time, no other Olympic gold medalists had. And there were pioneers before me, and their stories are validated and justified. Just because they didn't win a gold medal doesn't mean that, you know, their voices were not as powerful. Of course they were, and they they tried to speak up. But it was kind of a an important moment to say, hey, someone who actually, too, went to the Olympics and got a gold medal says this as well. It was just reaffirming everything that, you know, some of the other pioneers had spoken up before. And it was very few because people were afraid. They were afraid to lose their good standing. They were afraid, and it did happen because I was a case in point. Everything was stripped from me from the moment that I spoke up about abuse. And I remember being asked in that interview, well, what does that mean? You know, giving me a little push back a little bit, which is fine. You know, I have to answer it, and I, I was nervous, but I answered, what that meant. And we were treated in an inhumane way. And that's what was happening at the Crowley Ranch. And nobody wanted to believe the story, right? Nobody, everybody thinks, oh, this is the fairy tale there. And it's Bella. And it's, he loves you guys. And he's this teddy bear. And the unfortunate truth is nobody wants to believe how dark and sinister it all really was behind the scenes. And because we were young teenagers, nobody wanted to give us credit to to say anything or if we did try to speak up it was you're wrong or you know things like that um but I feel that that opened a big can of worms I mean that started a huge conversation that took me almost a decade until finally I remember in 2017 this was so distinct for me, because it had finally been a bit of vindication after all those years. So I came out in 2008 in that interview for HBO Real Sports. And then by 2017, when I was testifying and then all of the Larry Nassar stuff started coming out, then my home paper of the Houston Chronicle finally had a headline that said, Mochianu Vindicated. And that's the only time, it's the only time ever that somebody had vindicated what I had been saying. And I had been given a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback. And even athletes who were so scared to say anything because they had to go with the status quo and they wouldn't be invited back to events. And it was a very, very, I mean, tight, fine line. People did not want to say anything. And I was just disappointed by a lot of the community that let me down. So you let me out there to dry and hang my, like, really? You know, you know, but they weren't ready yet. And I was already light years ahead. And I get that. Everybody has to be ready at their own time, and I respect that. But, man, you all knew. You knew what was going on, and you let me out there, like, to just have everybody try to destroy my life. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, I'll never forget because I did not recover very well from that. Mm -hmm. took 10 years, my sponsorships, my financial state, everything. I had to find my own way back in life. And that's okay, but man, that was tough. You know, nobody can ever know what that's like unless they walked a mile in my shoes to know what that really took to feel so alone for a long time. 
And then it started to kind of sort of you know, come out little by little by little. And then it was like everybody was starting to come out when it was, you know, more comfortable and safe and, and all of that. But it was, it was a time where I almost, after so many years, I got so exhausted just, and I had women start coming to me about the Nassar story and I was funneling their stories and it was so emotionally taxing on me that I'd send them to, I said, you have to report, you have to report. So I felt like I, behind the scenes did something good for these women at that time that did trust me. And that was what that period of time for me being so outspoken helped transition to. So there are things that connect the dots from the past and from the history and from speaking up. I was the trusted one when they finally needed to go talk to someone, say, hey, that happened to me too. And then I'd guide them to go report and go get professional help and, and wherever I could. But I, like my husband said, I became this underground call center and I just couldn't believe how emotionally taxing it was on me. And I was taking those calls at night and working and coaching my athletes. And there were days I would be drained because it was so heavy. So I was like, couldn't believe this had gone on. And I would think to myself, Nassar has been around for 30 years. Can you mm. imagine how many athletes he's been around and some that will never come forward because it's so hard. Mm. It's so hard. And... I remember seeing him in Michigan in the courtroom and I looked at him and I was like, I shook my head at him. I'm like, you're never going to see the light of day. Shame on you for taking advantage of all these young, innocent kids, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I helped, you know, hopefully play a part in that. And um, I'm proud of all the women that were able to come forward too. But I feel because of that HBO Real Sports going to that story and really standing up for the first time kind of started that started that confidence building of like, okay, I'm going to do this. Even if I'm alienated, even if people call me names, even if they call me things that are not true, my life is ruined and destroyed. Nobody gives me financial opportunity again. Nobody gives me sponsorships again. I'm going to keep going. And my truth is never changed. Mm -hmm. It's always been the same. And I think that's what just kind of like kept me going is I felt like I was gonna be doing some good with it. It just was gonna take some time. But to be honest, right towards the end, I was talking to my husband. I'm like, I don't see when it's gonna finally come out. When is this all gonna finally come out? And when things started coming out with NASA, then we started seeing things unfolding. And it just felt like <sighs> sad that it had to be that way. We could have sounded the alarms with more people speaking up years ago, but but finally, it came to that moment where, you know, it was time. Um, so, so I think all of that was part of my story and part of my life to share and part of my experiences to go through and pain and hurt and disappointment and trauma and distrust in so many people that were so phony and fake to my face. And then behind my back, they would say something else. And it was just... It, it showed me a lot of people's true colors during those times. And I think I realized who my real friends were. Um, you really find that out at your lowest points, right? You find that out. And uh, I'm just glad we got to where we are today, you know, and make a difference. And we get to have this documentary um, front and center for all to see the vulnerabilities and the, you know, the stories and there's so much more to our lives as well. This is just a portion because you can only get so much in a 90 minute feature that can split our lives. But this is just hopefully the beginning. Absolutely. And I, and the change that you helped uh, make was for us as fans to see you as humans. You are not these athletes that are perfect and it, the little slightest mistake and, and you're demonized. So, um, you know, people like Simone Biles, who we were real excited to see in the documentary, are able to speak out when she's like, I'm not comfortable performing right now. Naomi Osaka is like, these press conferences give me anxiety. So you are you have paved the way and are continuing to be an inspiration to all of us. So thank you so much for everything that you do and for being so open and, and vulnerable in this film. And uh, I would like to talk about, real quick before we go, your Dominique Mucciano Gymnastics Center and how you're paving the way for the gymnastics of the future. Yes, I actually just got uh, 
finished with a competition this weekend where my athletes competed and I got on a 3 a.m. flight and I was like, okay, I got to go. Well, got to the airport early um, for a 6 a.m. flight. So 3 a.m. wake up call. But yes, um, you know, my gymnastics center has been a labor of love. It's been almost six years since we've opened. And in May, it'll be six years exactly, May 31st. But it's been a, a journey, you know. I, I love helping athletes. I love being an inspiration in their lives. I love developing them and shaping them and showing them what they can do when they can be, you know, just reaching their fullest potential. I, I get a lot of joy in seeing them develop in that way. And hopefully I've made lasting impacts in their lives. I I really hope that that's what I do for them. And uh, it's it's a joy to be able to help them. There are challenges that come along with any ownership and, and any gymnastics club and staffing and things. But, you know, the people that we have there right now are pretty amazing. And um, the staff and the children and everyone who really is for the mission is, you know, is doing everything possible to make those experiences for the kids positive. Thank you so much for sitting down with us, Dominique. Again, the documentary is called She Looks Like Me. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much. Hey, Bitch Talkers, we're back at South by Southwest 2024. We are very excited to introduce the next writer, director of the film, Bob Trevino Likes It. Welcome to Bitch Talk. Can you introduce yourself? Thank you. My name is Tracy Lehman, and uh, yeah, the writer, director, and one of the producers. Great. And can you tell our audience who has yet to see Bob Trevino Likes It, what's it all about? Um, It's inspired by a true story and a true friendship about how I was looking for my dad online. He was kind of upset with me and he kind of took off. (laughs) And so I thought, oh, I'll, you know, I tried calling, tried emailing, and then I put his name into Facebook. I thought maybe he's on Facebook and um, accidentally friended another man with his name. And uh, (laughs) that man became more of a father figure for nine years, uh, more of a father figure to me than my dad ever was. So. Oh, Tracy, I don't know whether to thank you or be angry with you for making me cry so much, first of all. Uh, Really beautiful, touching story. And then you find out that it's based on your real life experience. And that was just like really overwhelming. So thank you for such a heartwarming film. We need films like this definitely in times like right now. Um, But a big thing that it reminded me of was something that my dad taught me with his actions was sort of this butterfly effect that um, just being kind to people, anyone you meet at the store or your server or whoever it is, you don't know how that's going to brighten someone's day. And then from even the smallest things to something that your Bob Trevino did for you. So can you talk about this relationship that formed and how just little things really shifted something in you that you really were longing for. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, you know, and by the way, he had, he had such access and he didn't know he had this access, you know, so our acts of kindness, you know, you don't know what, how someone could take what, you know, the, the kindness or how they need it, you know, um, just all the, all these years, basically like my birthday, you know, my dad would never say happy birthday to me. I never got a message from him and I would get the, and the actual name was Bob Lehman, the, 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 gentleman that, 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 you know, this, this whole film is for, inspired by, um, and I would get a notification, Bob Lehman says happy birthday, and Bob Lehman says, you know, hey, how's it going, Bob, and, you know, I got a little, I, I used to have really long hair, and I cut my hair during the pandemic, and some people were kind of, like, picking on me about my haircut, and, and it's like, Bob Lehman says, I think it looks great, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, just so many things, my dad never came to any of my screenings, my shorts, or my music videos, or anything like that, and, and, um, you know, I'd get a notification, Bob Lehman says, way to go, kiddo, you know, and, and, it, and so it just filled this void, you know, I didn't, I'd done a lot of therapy, but there was something about this that went straight to my shot, it went straight to my heart, it was like a straight shot to my heart, and um, I just thought, how much, how, what kind of access do we have, you know, like, how can we change people's lives, and, it, and the fact that he didn't even know that it was changing my life, and he just kept doing it, you know. Did you ever think that this would be a documentary or was it always going to be a feature length film? And when did you think about actually turning this into a film? Well, um, originally I wrote a really happy go lucky draft. You know, um, it was just, it was really just to tell him what he meant to me. That was completely why I did it. Um, I hadn't told him and, and I thought, I have to, I have to tell him. Um, and then I lost, I wrote the, I, I wrote the script, very happy go lucky. Then there were, you know, I guess I can say he, he passed, you know. And um, I couldn't believe, before I got the opportunity to hand him the script that I had already written, uh, I was literally going to, to his Facebook to message him for this, and his wife had posted that he had passed away. 
And I just was in such shock, you know, I thought, I can't uh, believe I didn't tell him. The whole point of this was to tell him, you know. And so, of course, I wanted to tell his widow, who was also my Facebook friend, and, and she'd become, you know, really supportive and wonderful as well. And I thought, I need to give her some time. She's grieving. After, and I waited about a month. I got her on the phone. I said, can we talk? I got her on the phone. I told her what he had meant to me. I said he had changed my whole life. I said, I never got to tell him, so now I'm going to tell everybody. So... <laughs> I rewrote the script <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, to, to, to be, you know, uh, it was bigger than me then, you know, it was bigger than mm. just a message to him. It was a message to everybody about how we can change the world through little things, you know. Yes, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because I was reading your director's statement and I'm actually going to forward it to a friend who really <laughs> needs to hear a lot of the things that you're processing yeah. throughout the making of this film. And one thing I wanted to highlight was this idea that we need to earn love yeah. from somebody yeah. and realizing when we have toxic relationships and like we don't need to keep them. There are people out there that are willing to love us. We don't have to earn it and fight for it yeah. the whole time. That's not real love. So can you talk about that? I mean, it was really a powerful director's statement. Oh, thank you. I, yeah, I was, you know, my whole life I thought, oh, I have to fix everything. I have to earn it. I have to think of everybody else's needs except my own, you know, to try to take care of everybody so that they'll love me, you know. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this, you know, new friend was just doing things just out of kindness and just out of real genuine support. I, it was like watering a plant, you know, like I, I was like, oh, wow, I can bloom. I can blossom. Like I, I don't, you know, I don't have to. Um, and I, I think what I, what I like to say a lot of the time, this movie is about um, learning to let go of the people that continually hurt you to make room for the people that want to love you. And what I learned, and I learned it both through Facebook Bob, but I also learned it through the cast and crew of this film, you know, because they were, it was so beautiful and transformative to have, have thought that maybe people didn't support me or I had to earn everything and, and to look out and say, all these people are there to support the story that I wrote, you know, and all these people were showing up or like a family, like this is more of the meaning than a family, you know, than my actual family in some ways. So, so um, a story about chosen family while you're finding your chosen mm -hmm. family is mm -hmm. kind of surreal. <laughs> it's very you know? Ida, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was Bob still creating his butterfly effect. Yes, on you. yes, and his family was at the premiere yesterday. Oh. So um, oh. his 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 widow Terry and his daughter Alora, who actually plays the cashier. Uh, I cast her. She had done some acting in high school, and I said, um, and, the, and the line was, "Your dad got it," you know. So I said, "Will you come do this?" You know, "Will you come do this?" Oh, with the hardware store. Yes, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's her. And so when, when I cast her, and I explained that she was going to be Taft Hartley, and you know all that, you know that she's going to be running, and that she could keep working, you know. Um, she said, "I feel like my dad's still sending me gifts," you know. And and Terry, his widow, she read the the older script um, a year after he passed. And she said it gave her closure, you know. And then last night his granddaughters were there, and they said, you know, thank you for for sharing this and showing how that's this kindness because it lives on, you know. His kindness lives on through this film. So, mm. well, you kind of segued to my next question, which was great. Thank you. <laughs> um, I did want to talk about casting. I mean, mm. I love Barbie from Euphoria, of yeah. course. John Leguizamo, who doesn't love him? <laughs> French Stewart, hello. Yeah, like, yeah. Can you talk about the casting process and yeah. were you part of it? Mm. Um, and I saw that at least uh, Barbie and John are also EPs. So yeah, absolutely. How yeah. did they jump on board? Um, so Barbie was on first. You know, I was like Barbie, Barbie, Barbie for months. <laughs> I was like Barbie, Barbie. And uh, who doesn't love Barbie? But the, you know, it was it wasn't just one thing from her. It was how she show one side of herself on one project and another side on another. And she's just a wonderful human being. You know, um, whether it was her vulnerability or her ability to be positive. Um, and she has this kind of she's able to get excited about the little things in life. You know, and. And uh, which Lily definitely does, you know, so. Um, and I also wanted to work with really kind people, especially a movie about kindness. I want the cast and tr crew to be treated right. You know, it's really important, especially in this story, but really in any story. Um, so I, I brought her on, I met with her, and she was everything I knew she'd be in more, you know. Um, so she was first on. Um, she was supported the film the whole time, so she came on as EP. Um, you know, working with us in every possible way, you know, looking at the development process. Um, and then um, I got an opportunity to go to John Leguizamo. And who doesn't love him? He's amazing, <laughs> right. obviously. Especially his, you know, I, I really love his kind of subtle, nuanced work, like in The Power or When They See Us. And mm -hmm. especially, and I'd seen him be a father figure in those those projects. So I was like, oh, okay, I think I think you'd get this, you know. And it was an interview I saw with him where he was talking about family and talking about something about kind of like anti-bullying kind of stuff. And I thought, well, that really is this movie, you know. This is a positive uh, film about social media and about the acts, how we can use it for good, you know, and it, it, this this could have gone so differently. This this new friendship, he could have been 
creepy or catfishing yeah yeah yeah. all of it yeah or or or, oh i mean something to you now i'm gonna like be mean you know whatever you know and so um i thought he's really gonna get it i flew to new york met with him and i I said i've been saying you know by the third or fourth time he said in the meeting he said they hit my shoulder and said oh yeah bro i said oh i think we're doing this movie (laughs) (laughs) i think we're doing this (laughs) it was lovely you know he's a lovely human being you know and actually in between i brought french on um he, I'm friends with his wife, who's a wonderful writer and a good friend of mine. And we have a writing group. And she said, oh, I'm going to bring French today to read, you know, in the writing group. And I thought, oh, cool, awesome. And, and, and Robert, his character, didn't even have a name yet. It was Lily's dad, you know. So I said, okay, French, you're here. You can read really, Lily's dad. And I hadn't actually thought of him for that. But he sat down and he just nailed it on a cold read in the, in the writing group. And I said, well, that's done. You know, that's cast. Never thought about anybody else. That was it. Yeah. Wow. So. <laughs> well, before we wrap, the one thing I, I want to talk about is this rage room. Where can I find one? Uh, <laughs> and did you enjoy it yourself? <laughs> well, I, I haven't been to, I haven't, you know, done it myself yet, but I did scout them and I did live vicariously through people with, you know, when we were scouting and also through Barbie. And, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's incredible. I mean, we all have this anger we need to express in healthy ways, you know. So um, it was really beautiful in the, in the premiere yesterday because, um, people cheered you know and yes, I, yeah exactly. and i think we all need that we all need that kind of release you know so. mm-hmm. well the movies bob trevino likes it we loved it so much and thank you for sitting down with us oh, tracy thank you so much i really appreciate it yeah. thanks for joining us on today's show you can find more information about this episode in our show notes If you're missing us, you can visit us at bitchtalkpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter and buy us a cup of coffee. Did you know we're also on the radio? You can find us at bff.fm. And lastly, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. All the cool bitches are doing it. This podcast is a proud member of the bff.fm podcast network. Learn more at podcasts.bff.fm. BFF.fm, best frequencies forever.